going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to a very spooky 404 show. I'm Jeff Bacalar. I'm Justin Yu. Welcome. I know we must look crazy, but it's because we have a brand new studio, ladies and gentlemen. Check All this right. out. This is amazing. You know what else? I, I just, I can't talk with this thing on. It's fine. Yeah, you still it's look fine. terrifying. It's still very scary. Uh, happy Halloween. We hope you're really digging the, uh, the new studio. We want to thank everyone uh, from our San Francisco team that was out here and put this together in record-breaking time. Yeah. So thanks to all those guys. Uh, and yeah, I'm just delighted that we're finally in here. This is yeah. something we've been trying to do for a very long time. Want to wave hi to Ariel over there? Check out these shots. We have all these cameras inside the studio that give you an angle on every single spot. Look so at that. there's Mark over there, too, helping us out with the jib. Thanks, you guys. Hey, Mark. Hey. Hey. All right, well, this is great. Uh, as you can see, the set is, uh, it's missing a few things. It's spooky, but it's missing a few things. If you guys have something uh, in mind that we should use to fill up the, uh, the studio, let us know. Email us, and maybe we'll go out and buy it and put it in there. Right? Maybe, maybe. Could happen. Maybe. Uh, other than that, I think it's business as usual. So let's get right in to the first story of the day. Take it away, sp spam Justin. Like this? Huh? I don't like it, but it's okay. My outsides match my insides. <laughs> let's get into the stories of the day. Yes. Uh, this is the first one. So we're in the middle of a big landmark court case right now. And it's about Google Glass. Okay. So it's finally come down to people committing crimes using Google Glass. Oh, really? And uh, the latest one is a woman in California who's the first person ever to get a ticket, a moving violation for driving with glass. So it's illegal in California to drive with glass. Well, there's some, there's some red tape here that we need to talk about. Okay. So th the story starts with this woman named Cecilia Abadie. Right. A couple days ago, she posted on her Google Plus page a right. photo of this ticket that she got. And you could see that it was initially because she was driving 80 miles per hour in a 65 miles per hour zone. But way down in the corner here where that circle is on your screen, you could see that the officer also cited her for, quote, driving with a monitor visible to the driver. Huh. So have you, you've heard of this law in California, at least. Oh, I, I, I think it's pretty much illegal wherever you are. Right. You can't drive around watching TV. Yeah. Is essentially what it is. Right. right. You basically can't have any monitor in front of you uh, that shows video. Right. So I guess that could technically include GPS. I was just going to say, obviously, there's got, there's got to be some sort of like uh, legalese that, that puts those things in a different category. Right. Right. Yeah. right. It says, the legalese says, if the monitor is visible to the driver and displays anything other than vehicle information or global positioning. Gotcha then you can't have it, which includes Google Glass. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth on her Google Plus page about people who are sort of arguing whether or not Google Glass will impede your driving skill. Okay. What do you think of that? Uh, I think uh, it would distract me mm -hmm. just because uh, they're not like regular glasses. I mean, we've had them on before. Right. They're, they're, you, you can tell, like, it, it, it definitely takes away your attention. There's no way. It does. There's no way around that. I don't think it takes your attention away more than a really cool billboard does, though, or sure. something like that. Yeah, or yeah. a bunch of crying kids in the back seat. That could also be a huge That's distraction. That's arguably the worst. Yeah, but also I think you could argue that having Google Glass in front of you, it's worse than having a, a cell phone go off because you can't turn it off. I mean, you can. You could drive without them powered on. Right. But if they're on and you get a message, that'll pop up in the display, right? Okay. As opposed to just vibrating in sure. your pocket like sure. a regular phone yeah. would. It's really in invasive. Yeah. So I, I would kind of be a little scared if someone was driving and I was a passenger in this car. I just don't think we can handle all these things. Right. You know, I, I don't know. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't been in like a really brand new car in a couple years, mm -hmm. but from what I gather, there's already a lot of junk in them right. that's taking my eyes away from the road. Right. And I don't understand like why some things are okay and why other things are not okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the car does enough of the distracting. You don't need to bring your own. This woman got a ticket. Right. She was speeding anyway. She deserved a ticket for that, but instead she got one for wearing Google Glass, right. which must have been so awesome to give her that ticket. I just feel don't like, feel bad for somebody like, like this. So you are now served, nerd. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And she can afford it too. Of she course, can drop she can. Fifteen hundred on a pair of glasses. She could definitely, she can definitely afford 1, it. Fifteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So I don't really blame her for that. 
In fact, I think all Google Glass owners should pay a douche tax, and this is sort of something like that. I thought you were going to say all Google Glass owners should be put in jail. That's what I thought you were going to say. Soon they will be, perhaps. Right. Right. So the laws on this stuff is is kind of kind of hazy, and uh, I think one state police need to definitely draft new legislation around these new devices that sure. can display more than video. Sure. Uh, I think the other thing is that car manufacturers need to kind of work with Google, and and those those legislatures. To sort of get the laws in check with how Google Glass is going to work on the road. Right. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of technologies coming out that sort of integrate Google Glass and kind of take you away from the actual monitor. Sure. So the latest thing to do that is uh, Mercedes-Benz. They developed a navigation system um, that actually uses voice activation um, from the in-car navigation. And so it, this is the way it works. You know, if you look up uh, you know, driving directions with, with Google Glass... Uh, when you're walking, it'll show that in your glass monitor. But once you step into the car, the navigation system takes over for the car. Gotcha. And it'll speak those directions to you uh, over the stereo system, so you don't actually have to look inside the monitor or okay. Google Glass. That's a good way to do it, right? It's a, small, it's a more elegant, seamless sort of way. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And I think we'll start seeing this more as, as more Google Glasses come out. But will they come out? Oh, they've already come out. <laughs> Google actually debuted two new models this week, and this is what they look like. So, I mean, a lot of people complain that the original models were really nerdy, and this one doesn't seem any different. Equally nerdy. Yeah, but that model, he's not nerdy at all. Well, he's because got, he has a samurai ponytail? Oh, well, he's got, like, really nice hair. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's, like, he's that just, just enough... Just enough apathy that right. he's not shaving completely. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Why are Google Glass models so freaking sexy is what I want to know. This guy makes it look good. He makes it look good. He really does. The big difference in this model is you can see there's an earbud in his right ear that comes out of Google Glass. Oh, okay. That replaced the bone conduction speakers that right, they were right. using. Yep. And that, didn't, that apparently didn't work very well, so now they're using uh, earbuds. Okay. But soon that'll come out to everyone in the pilot program, so if you've already paid for a Google Glass, you're, you can you, trade this in. Oh, you can trade it in. Trade okay. in your old one for the new one. That's yeah. pretty neat. I didn't realize you're, uh, you're in for life with that. Yeah, That's yeah, you sick. signed a contract. That's nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, uh, what else do we have here? Well, uh, the next story is about a really cool update to uh, a story that we actually talked about last month in September. Do okay. you remember Phone Blocks? Yes. Uh, phone Blocks was a, uh, a, a, like a, not a Kickstarter, but like a, a, a proof of concept project where we had, uh, you had like a, a board, mm -hmm. and, that, and you could use pieces of the board to, to dedicate. To build your own phone. Right, basically. and build your own phone yeah. and dedicate some some you know features uh, more space on the board than others. So right. I think we have a video here. So basically, you were you were saying, so, oh, I want the phone to be you know uh, very uh, uh, a lot of horsepower. Right. So, so you can you, update the processor. Right. So you can uh, so you can devote more of the board to the processor. Yeah, it's, it's kind of genius. It was brilliant. It seemed almost like science fiction though. Well, it's just kind of brilliant because I feel like now, you know, if you have your iPhone for two years, it starts slowing down because it can't handle that operating system. You mean six months. Right. Or maybe it's a little shorter than that. Yeah. But the idea here is that maybe someday you won't have to upgrade the entire thing just because the battery life crapped out or because it's slow. You could just pop in a new processor. Right. Or if you're a photographer, you can, you know, maybe swap battery life for a bigger lens on your camera. True. Something that, like that. Super smart. The video is so amazingly... I know. Uh, uh, you just feel like you're in the future when you see that kind of video. Yeah. Turned out it was like very far-fetched, It right? was just a video. Yeah, it was, it was a proof of concept. And they were sort of calling for public awareness to sort of get brands on board and the right people uh, to see this so, so that awesome. maybe one day it could become reality. Well, guess and there was what? a lot of criticism about this. I think even we said that. This is never going to come out. Well, we were just like, look at it. It's too cool to be true. Like, right. And then now tell everyone what happened. So fast forward to just one month later. You know, we kind of thought this timeline would be years in the future. We'd be like telling our grandkids about it. Right. <laughs> we like that when we were really young. Yeah. And we also said 3D movies weren't going to be a big deal. <laughs> we were right. <laughs> 3D movies are terrible. No one watches People 3D movies. People love those things. It's like Avatar and Gravity. That's it. Yeah. Those are pretty much the only name, two popular Name the ones. third one that was good. Uh, it was Avatar. Avatar was the one that you had to see. Right. And then Gravity is, you know, the new one. But what's the third one that you have to see in 3D? Nothing. Because <laughs> nobody cares. Yeah, that's true. No one needs to see the internship in 3D. <laughs> 
Maybe that would have made it funny. Yeah. All right, what, what uh, so, what's uh, happening? One month later, Motorola issued a press release this week, and uh, we were taking a look at it earlier today, and CNET actually wrote on this story, and they issued a press release for something called Project Aura, and here it is. Project R, they describe as an open source modular smartphone platform. That sounds pretty familiar, right? Did they just jack phone blocks? Well, see, this is where it gets kind of interesting. The concept is, is essentially the same, right? It'll start with this sort of endoskeleton, and then they're going to invite third-party developers to sort of create different pieces for the phone. It looks really cool. Yeah, and the thing is they've been sort of hinting at this for a while, and the blog Fandroid actually says that they've been working on this for the past year. Yeah. But they've also recently announced a partnership with a guy who put up the original video for phone blocks. Gotcha, okay. So there's so sort of a little slice with each other, okay. but we're not sure whether or not that phone blocks video was maybe a viral campaign to sort of see if people would be interested in this coming Ooh, to life. I like that. So that's sort of what the internet is, is sort of speculating. Right okay. Now. Um, so oh, that internet with their conspiracy theories. Yeah. But think about it, it, it makes sense. You do that. The video was cheap to do. Mm -hmm. You do it to gauge interest. Is there a buzz? Is there not a buzz? Right. Uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. I really wonder if they were behind it, but I don't know. It sort of makes sense, and they were laying the groundwork for it. So Brian Bennett from CNET, the guy that reviews all the phones for our company, he wrote an article about the Moto X um, offering sort of customization earlier this summer. So the Moto X is their right. You can change phone, you right? can change the the trim line. You can right. change the the casing co uh, colors and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. so that was called Moto Maker, and right. uh, they they let you just change the aesthetics of it. But that's sort of hinting at at the future too, right? It's like customizing your phone and personalizing it to what you want it to sure. be. Sure. And this is hopefully the next evolution of that. That's very cool. And if anyone were to make this a reality, it'd be Motorola, right? They got bought out by Google, Google a few Google, months yeah. ago. Makes sense. Android's an open source platform. Do you think there are still things standing in the way of this coming to life? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just don't think the technology is there. I just, I just, I'm not buying it yet. Like right. we see these prototypes. Is this a real thing? Yeah. Once I, I don't, I don't believe anything until I see it. Right. I've, I've been walking around this earth long <laughs> enough to know that I can't just trust, especially in tech, man. Right. Come it's on, not our first like podcast. And it's this ain't our first podcast. <laughs> you know, and then like, how many times you get pitched a product that sounds so good on paper, right? And the second it comes at, you know, arrives at your door, yeah. Galaxy Gear. <laughs> Who said that? No, no but no. seriously, like, uh, it turns out it's not as great as advertised. Right. So until this thing's in our hands and we're playing around with it and it delivers. Uh huh. All we can do now is uh, is just judge. You know what I'm speculate. most dubious about? Is what? The fact that you're going to need a circuit board, that baseboard, right, that we saw earlier in the video. You're going to need a circuit board that can attach any kind of plug to it, no matter if it's a graphics card right. or a processor sure. or a hard drive. We still haven't seen this technology used in desktop computers. Right, there's no streamlined. Yeah, you still need yeah. different chips and DIMMs for right. your memory. There's no universal platform for building a computer yet, much so, less a phone. And you're, you make a good point. So not only would, so Motorola slash Google would have to revolutionize that yeah. entire sort of uh, 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 interface, right. you know, landscape, and then from there, and maybe that's what they did. Yeah. Maybe that's what they did, man. This would be cool. And I'm sort of speculating that maybe it could go beyond technology. You know, for example, if one day somebody needs to test their blood sugar level, someone could create an accessory for your phone specifically that you could do that with. Like a, it doesn't have to like just a be diabetes and, adapter. Yeah, exactly. Did you say diabetes? I said, yeah, I meant to say diabetes. Okay. Is it di diabetes? I'm basically dressed as diabetes. For <laughs> right you now, are diabetes. Right? <laughs> That's basically You're me. walking, talking, diabetes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mom. Uh, so that's phone blocks. We might see it happen one day. That's we might cool, not. Man. But I think just the fact that companies are optioning this to try. I'm into it. Just the it. fact that they're going through with it and, and trying to make it happen. Yeah. That's admirable. I think it's a step in the right direction. And just so you know right now, it's not going to be offered on Verizon. No. Because they don't like to have fun with anything. Right. Because I can't get my Nexus 5 on oh, that's Verizon. That's right. That's not on there. We need to get uh, Roger in here. To sort of like, talk to us about that. I just want to know. I just want to talk to somebody about it. Yeah. All right. Maybe tomorrow. Um, we got one more. Uh, we got one more story. Then we're gonna do a break. Then we have a little show and tell. So let's let's hear what we got. What's up uh, before the break here? All right. So I, I sort of want to talk about data preservation, and uh, we talk about archive.org a lot. And uh, those are the guys that are basically trying to archive the entire internet, everything right. that's ever been put online. Yes. They want to get a hold of. And uh, you know, there's all these questions about how do we ensure the data that we put online is going to be there for not just our kids, but 
you know, generations, thousands, millions of years in the future, how are they going to be able to access this information? Through a barge in the water. Yes, and Google will be at the helm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Captain Google at the helm. Right. Well, hopefully well, there won't be just one big corporation in charge of all this stuff, right? right. They're not going to rewrite history of course. themselves. Of yeah. So believe it or not, your Snapchats, your Google photos, all your Facebook photos, those are cultural artifacts that you're going to want to keep around to preserve. And the internet's really good at sort of burying digital materials. But there's at least one artist collective in the Netherlands that's hoping to sort of preserve their own collection, a time capsule, if you will, of Dutch art specifically. So um, okay. this, this artist collective, and I'm going to butcher this name, but it's called La Societe Anonym. And uh, this is the website for it right now. They're deciding to preserve their own collection of Dutch art with something they call the score index. I'm not a big, like... I don't know a lot of artists and stuff. Dutch got a lot of good artists. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. The Netherlands, there's a ton of great design coming out of there. Copenhagen, yeah. all that Co stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Definitely. That's good. I, yeah, okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm not a big art guy. I mean, derail me here. Come I'm here. sorry, sorry, Dutch guy. Well, wait till you see the photos of this book, and then that'll show you how, how well designed this stuff is. Fair enough. So the, the, the book is called The Score Codex. Oh, that's cool. And this book contains encoded sound recordings, oh, wow. images, and diagrams, all written in binary code. So um, you can access an electronic version of this in PDF online if you want to follow along as well. But here are some photos of it. Is really it, crazy stuff. I appreciate what, what's going on here. Right. Am I crazy in thinking the worst way to back up the internet is with a book? On paper. It was on paper. Yeah, paper will be around forever. <laughs> not like we can't just burn that it's up. It's not like paper like breaks down it. after a while right. and becomes garbage. Well, hopefully... That won't happen because there's eight of these books in existence. Oh, hey, hey, eight. <laughs> You'd think that if it was supposed to survive forever, they would publish more than eight copies of it, right? Or uh, And on something not paper. Yeah, there's going to be way more Playboys running around than actual codec books. Put it on styrofoam. That stuff more. never breaks down. That's true. Right? <laughs> Should have just put it on styrofoam. It's illegal. It just carved it. <laughs> That'll be like the new Moses tablets. Yeah. Just... Styrofoam. It's like the back of a McDonald's box right. or something like that. <laughs> there you go. Well, not everybody has these books. Uh, one copy was given to the guy that invented the World Wide Web. Three more were given away to <laughs> Wait, anonymous people. Just, <laughs> the guy who invented the World Wide Web? Yeah, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. What? Yeah. Sir the, Tim Berners-Lee pioneered the do infrastructure. Do we all agree on that? Oh, yeah. Are we, we all agree that Tim... Lear, well, who? Tim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. Well, he laid the foundation for what would eventually become the input-output. Not the, what happened to like the, the whole uh, DARPA thing. Could we get Wikipedia in here to sort of verify these claims? Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying, like, right? It seems a little strange. I know, I know. I thought it was Al Gore. Well, that's who they gave it to. Okay. So they gave it to this guy. All right. They gave three copies to people that they're not naming because they don't want those people to get murdered for their books. <laughs> for their... Yeah, I get it. And then the last one is actually living inside uh, the, the headquarters oh. of SCORE, as well as on the internet. Cool. Right. So this is sort of a lot like that golden record that we love talking about so much. Right. Remember that golden record? Yeah. There are basically two records that were included on the Voyager spaceship that launched in 1977. All right, this is kick-ass. There were two records, and they were actually golden, too. I want to see if I can pull up a photo of this. Or Can you do that while I'm talking about the this? The golden record. The golden record, and they were made out of gold-plated copper and aluminum. Just so you know, when I pull stuff up, it doesn't matter. No oh, okay. Yeah, you can't see it. <laughs> okay, then I will Google it. Hey, it's our first day in the new studio. We're still trying to work things out. Oh, there it is. I'm really enjoying it. Only you. <laughs> So here's a picture of it. Uh, this is what it looks like. Oh, cool. So these uh, gold-plated copper records actually contain music, noises, and photos that were selected by NASA. Right. Uh, side note, in a committee that was selected by Carl Sagan. I think that's really cool. That is very cool. So Carl Sagan decided what's exactly on these records that maybe, maybe if we encounter other life forms in space, they'll be able to listen to these phonographs. It's not maybe. It's It's... When? Maybe Sandra Bullock will listen to it's it. It's when. Yeah. Just want you to know that. So you want to know what noises are on these records? Yep. Uh, there are sounds that sort of made by nature, things like waterfalls and birds chirping, animal sounds and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's greetings in 56 languages and music, like Beethoven, Mozart, Bruno Mars. Bruno no, Mars? just kidding. <laughs> Bruno Mars is not Carl, <laughs> But you totally like Carl that. Carl Sagan was like... Somehow was clairvoyant into yeah, the future. Yeah. Let's get Bruno Mars on there. 
No, but Chuck Berry is on there, though. And that's, that's the cool. most modern artist that's, that's, pretty that's cool. featured on the Golden I think Red. that's like a friendly, you know, inter, well, not international, but like intergalactic uh, music. Right. Yeah. The strange thing is that they don't actually include a record player with this. So I'm not sure how the aliens are actually going to listen to the record. We're also assuming they'll understand one of 56 languages this that we have had on our planet. Right, right. Don't worry yourself with these little uh, inconsequentials there. Yeah. So anyway, this, uh, this, this Dutch book is sort of like that. It's preserving Just what on we a have much now for the future. And on a much worse yeah, uh, uh, medium. Much more analog, yeah, disposable yeah. Much, level. Much more, much more uh, flammable. Right. Yeah, at least <laughs> bury that in the ground in a lockbox or paper? something. Why paper? Why did they do this on paper? <sighs> when you want to preserve something forever, you're like, we should make that out of paper. Right. That's why they build cars and everything, everything out of paper. <laughs> yeah, durability. <laughs> right. Oh, those Dutch people. Oh, it's raining. The book's done. Oh, that's it. End of the story, you guys. What happened? You you flipped the page too quickly? Oh, 17 years of the internet have just right. been destroyed. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for this story. I think we're going to take a break right now. Yes, we will take a break, but when we come back, there is much more 404, including a very cool show-and-tell demo. You're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. A lot more 404 coming your way. We'll see you in a sec. Hey, welcome back to the 404 show. We're doing a little show and tell today. Uh, a couple of months ago, we got a product from a company called Plume, and they make something called the Pax, which is a portable vaporizer. Mm -hmm. Now, like e cigarettes are insanely popular. Right. They're everywhere. I see people, there's people in our office who just, all they do all day is they're sucking on this thing. Right. It's crazy. Uh, Plume is a San Franciscan company that makes a device that is basically the apple of portable vaporizers. What they have here is something called the Pax, and it is the most elegant device I've seen that's just designed for you to smoke tobacco. Right. So it's a really, really, like, you, you hold on to this thing and you feel like you're, it's like plutonium. Right. It's like one of the props from Back to the Future. Or something like that. It's it's a pretty high end device. Okay. All so, the, well, I was just gonna say, like, all, you see all these like e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. They don't really work on like very complicated technologies. They're just sort of right. like uh, they have a little cartridge, and 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 that's and you get the nicotine, and that's how it works. But what this does is, and what separates this is, the, if you smoke cigarettes and you don't want to smoke like a real cigarette, which right. is probably because it's tar, it's tar and, and smoke and all this awful crap in there. This will actually vaporize tobacco for you wherever you go. Yeah, so how does this work? Does it actually just heat it up right before it catches on fire? Or how, so, how does that So I read up a little bit, uh, and we actually had one of our buddies in the office use this for a couple weeks, and he loves it. I'm mm -hmm. actually going to give it to him when we're done here. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way this works is it brings tobacco, uh, it raises the temperature up to the point right before combustion. Right. And then it turns that into vapor. And then you just, you know, you suck away on the thing. Right. So here's how it works. Check this out. This is really amazing. So it's got this magnetic little clip in the bottom here. You put your tobacco, and they and Plume sells these little, like, tobacco canisters. But you can use anything. You can, you use, can use any kind of loose leaf tobacco in that. I get, yeah, you, you could really probably use... Any kind of flour. Anything. You want in there. Any, you could use anything. Okay. Anyway, um, so what you do is you, you, you pack it in this little oven here, right? You pop on this magnetic little clip, which is great because it's magnetic. You can just even go down like that, and, it's, and it stays. Right. Then... You, I got some spider webs on it. Then you click it, right? And it starts cooking. And you see that little like glowing light? Now here's where it becomes Apple. Because it's like this glowing, like sleeping light. Mm -hmm. Like when you close a MacBook. Yeah, it's purple right now. Right? So this will go and go and go. And when it turns green, then it's ready. So it brings 
the, 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 the tobacco in here up to the point right before combustion. Mm -hmm. Now check this out. You can rip off the mouthpiece up top here. Mm -hmm. All right. Now when you look in there, it's got uh, a temperature gauge setting. I swear, this is insane, right? How amazing is this? So you click this button and that changes the color, right? So, okay, red is super hot, right. yellow is not so hot, and then orange is like in the middle. And, you know, if you're a big smoker, you probably have like a preference as to how you want your, your right. you know, tobacco like vaporized. Right, lights versus reds. Right, exactly. real cigarettes. So that's it. And, uh, and then when you're all done, you just click it. You just go like this. You're like, oh, I'm done uh, smoking my vaporizer. You click it, and it's off. Okay? It gets better. Mm -hmm. When you're using it, it charges, which I'll show you how it charges in a second. When you're using it, here, I'll show you. If you come in real close, you shake it, and it'll tell you how much battery is left. So oh, see, it's cool. like yellow yeah. right mm -hmm. now. That means it's like halfway done. You shake it again. Okay, it's yellow. Now when you need to charge it, here's my favorite part. You close it upside down. Look at that, it's got a little docking station. Mm -hmm. Can you get in on that? And look, it's now charging. Pretty cool. I like that. Not bad, huh? Yeah, so we've actually talked to that coworker who's been using it for a week, and yeah. you know, I think there, he, he vocalized some complaints about it. And I think the first thing that I'm noticing here- Well, that's good, because it's not perfect. Right, it's yeah. not perfect. Sure. First of all, it's $250. Right, oh, so yes. So that's, that's, that's a big price. note here. $250 yeah. is a lot of cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> it's a, is it, though? You can buy a lot of cigarettes. How much are cigarettes now? Like, like 40 th bucks? 14, $14 in New York. Okay. Oof. That's a lot of that's money. A, oof, bad place to pick up smoking. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's an expensive place to pick up Right, so to start, to start off, $250 is a lot of money. This basically is a contract for you to be a lifelong smoker. You're not going to invest in something like this and then quit five years down the road. Well, ideally, you just don't want to smoke anything ever. Right, and we'll <laughs> right. get into that more later. <laughs> right. But, you know, in terms of the specifics of this thing, the first thing that I'm noticing is that it uses a proprietary charger. It does. I really wish that it had a mini yeah. USB charger because yeah. they sell these, I think, for $30. On, uh, for an extra charger, and that's kind of a lot of money. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's $35. Yeah. So if you want one for the office or uh, as well as home, you're gonna have to shell out even more money to get an extra charger. Uh, he also was talking about the maintenance. Oh, right, yeah. So the maintenance thing is also a little troublesome too because, you know, like anything that has a lot of moving parts, you're gonna need to clean it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the targ buildup gets uh, pretty thick inside of there, and a lot of people have actually complained about the mouthpiece sticking. Okay. So far, in fact, that plume now includes uh, mouth lubrication. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's well mouth well, piece, mouthpiece lubrication. So there's yeah. all these different sort of like uh, you know little cleaning accessories that come with right. it. It comes with a lot of like pipe cleaners because you really got to get in there and clean it out. Right. Um, you know, I've I watched a lot of the videos on how to clean this thing, and you really need to uh, be diligent with the, with the cleaning <laughs> and you have to they recommend doing it like every 12 times you uh you you use the vaporizer yeah, that's a funny. lot of cleaning like i don't know how often someone who, Depends who on how smokes, much you're using it. yeah like uh, whatever it is so you got the price you got the uh the the, the maintenance that's required mm -hmm. but at the end of the day it's a very imp impressive piece of technology I mean, I think we should also add that for people that use medicinal marijuana for medical purposes, they could definitely use this sure. in a more discreet way than just lighting a cigarette, right. you know, or yeah. using a pipe. This is a much for more sure. elegant way to do it. And I think the other thing that's great about this, and I guess this goes for a lot of portable vaporizers, is the fact that it's a great way to regulate the amount of smoke that you inhale. Okay. And so, to that's me, I would, I would say it's a difference... Um, you know, smoking a cigarette versus a vaporizer is the difference between using a sniper rifle and a shotgun. You know what I mean? When did as, you come up with that analogy? As opposed to taking a huge breath out of something, yeah. you can really regulate it so that you're getting sure. an intake the same every time. Absolutely. And, and that's really important. And like medicinally, you know, th th that medicinal marijuana, how that's delivered to the patient. Right. There is a lot of vaporizing technology that's used in doing that, which sure. we've talked about on the show before. But... For something that's so portable, mm -hmm. and it could be like a, a, a game changer in terms yeah. of uh, you know helping people who are sick. You know what's funny is uh, I was reading a lot of forums about this, and I got a pro tip from somebody on Reddit. Pro tip that says if you really wanted to be discreet about it, you could wrap a pair of headphones around the packs and make it look like an iPod Nano, which it yeah. sort of does which because it true. comes in all these anodized yeah. colors. You can get it in purple and green and blue. Yeah, for sure. So you could definitely hide it. Um, it also looks like. Um, it looks like a, a baton in a relay race. Right. 
Yeah. Why you would be sucking on your iPod though is that you probably shouldn't do that with the some people are right. attached to it. I, see, I think that's the weird thing about electronic cigarettes and portable va vaporizers in general. It's just having to explain what you're doing to people that don't know what vaporizers are. Yeah. And uh, this happens all the time. You know, like I was in a Nordstrom's the other day, or I was in an elevator too, and the same thing happened. Some guy brought out one of those blue e-cigarettes yeah. and started smoking it in an enclosed space. With kids around, with elderly people. Well, there's people. no smoke. There, there's visible vapor. Though. But it's not smoke. It's not smoke, right. which is true, but having to explain that every time you want to smoke it in public can be a hassle. But I'm... That's got to be the worst part about it. And especially here in New York, everyone is rocking the, the you know, the e-cigarettes or right. whatever. Like, that is... I feel like that is just so insanely hot right now. Sure. And it's, in here in New York, like... Once a trend starts, it spreads like wildfire. Mm -hmm. um, but we thought this was a very interesting product. So thank you to the people over at Plume for hooking us up. Uh, you've made one of our coworkers very happy and hopefully a little healthier because yeah. he's not smoking cigarettes as much anymore. See, I think there's some Freakonomics here too because there I is. feel like the fact it's that it's clearly so easy to do everywhere means right. that you're going to probably smoke way more you're tobacco. Right. Totally right. Uh, but at the end of the day... Even, and even if the jury's still out on, like, is vaporizing tobacco safe? Is sucking on aluminum safe? Is, yeah, that's, you know. I've, I've been sucking on aluminum for a while, <laughs> and I'm fine. But no, is all this safe, yada, yada? It can't be worse than breathing in fire. Right, right. It's all the, bad for it's you all, is the point. Right. Yeah. So in moderation, but check it out. A little pricey, but we kind of dig it. Right. Uh, so that's our little show and tell. And today. you're also not going to get that gross cigarette smell on your fingers right. if you smoke too. So that's that's sort of a problem. That's what it's all about, man. But, you know, big thanks to the plume people, obviously. For but sure. But we do have to point out the obvious negative effects of smoking. We're not condoning of course. smoking, especially for people that are underage. Of course. Anytime you inhale nicotine, it's going to be bad for you and there are heinous side effects. Yes. And we could talk about this all day long, but instead of doing that, I want to show you these masks that a British online clinic called Health Express uh, created. Just to illustrate the effects of long-term tobacco use. And uh, we're going to end on this because it sort of has to do with Halloween because they're masks. So check these out. This is what they look like. Oh, my God. These masks that they've made, they show things like premature skin aging. Ugh. The risk of stroke and what that looks like after you've had a stroke. Throat cancer. Sagging skin. Oh, no, 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 no. Cataracts no, no. and all that. Don't play that video. Yeah, we're not going to play that video, okay. although we will add a link to it in the show notes today. So go to cnet.com slash the 404 and follow along. But uh, there's all kinds ranging from young to old. This is potentially what you guys are going to look like if you smoke tobacco. And you're that's just, true. You're just going to look lifeless. Yeah. Do you remember that site, Faces of Meth? Oh. It sort of looks like that. And could oh, you imagine what these masks want... would look like? Yeah, that's for bad news. Smokers? Yeah, that's messed up. Oof. Pretty bad. Well, this is, you know, it's good for Halloween, though. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, excellent. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. I think that I think does we made it for us. our first show on the new studio. All right. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Give us a call. Let you know. Let us know what you think. Obviously, this is a work in progress. We want it to be fun for everyone. 866-404-CNET is our phone number. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, all that other junk. And uh, we're still going to be doing the audio version too. So uh, if you're enjoying that. Thanks for sticking with us as well. We'll be back here tomorrow. Make sure you tune in. Until then, we'll see you very soon. I'm Jeff Bacalar. I'm Justin Yu. Thanks to Ariel, to Mark for rocking all the equipment in here. Yeah. We'll be back tomorrow. Have a fantastic and safe Halloween. We'll see you guys then. Later.